right. Hey guys, welcome to my live stream tonight. Can you hear me okay? If you guys can hear me, oops, let's see. If you guys can hear me all right, can you go ahead and just leave a message below, make sure everything's working okay? Let's see. Oops, okay, we're just gonna make sure. I don't have anyone doing sound right now, so I'm gonna check, make sure. Oh, yep. There we go. It's working. Okay. Thanks, guys. All right. Cool. So, <laughs> official official start to the live stream. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you all for joining me tonight. I'm really excited to be answering some questions that you guys um, have sent me and, and questions that you guys will be um, asking, hopefully, tonight. Um, if you guys are experiencing an error, you need to just restart the browser there. Um, so, I the Nathaniel Moore. Okay, great. Awesome. So everything's working now. Good. Um, okay, so um, I'm just going to say um, thank you all uh, for, for being here tonight. Um, last week I put out a question poll to my patrons over on Patreon, and so I'm going to start with their questions tonight first. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with that. Um, so one of the one of the patron questions that um, that was recently asked was let me pull it up here. Um, oh, you guys get Camille! Look, there she is! Oh my goodness! Yes, the kitty expert, the kitty clarinet expert, right here. Oh my gosh, this I did not do this on purpose. She she came here because she loves you guys. And also, I think she loves me. I don't know. Anyway, exactly, Camille! <laughs> okay, cool. So um, we're gonna start with um, Kevin Wheeler's question on tuning. So um, his question was, I'd like to know about tuning. What affects tuning in the various registers and are there exercises I can do? And, and he goes on about um, a recording session that was, was a, you know, he wasn't happy with because the clarinet was very sharp. And, um, and then he went on to ask about some fingerings and things like that. So um, honestly, um, there are a lot of things that can affect intonation. So, you know, if you're playing on a plastic clarinet, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what kind of clarinet you have, but we're going to start with the instrument. Um, so if you're playing on a plastic clarinet, like a Vito or a Selmer or an Old LeBlanc or whatever, um, they're all really great plastic instruments and, and um, you know, they're good for beginners, but um, they tend to go very sharp. And especially as you, you know, become a better player and, and you learn how to use your air and your armature and everything, those beginner clarinets, those plastic clarinets are, the pitch is just going to go way up. And so, um, I, I have a couple of ways to kind of mitigate that, but at some point it's just going to be kind of impossible to get those plastic clarinets to be in tune with themselves. Um, so check that. So if you're, if you're doing all right with that and you're playing on uh, a nicer intermediate clarinet or an entry level pro clarinet or even a pro clarinet and, and you're still playing really, really sharp, um, there are a few suggestions I have. So one is to just get a longer barrel if, if you can. Some people just play really sharp. I just play really sharp, so I have to actually pull out quite a bit. Also, I really love my um, Corbin, or well, my Royal Global Polaris barrel. It's a little adjustable barrel. It goes from 64 to 68 millimeters, and so in the middle of the summer, when I'm blowing really sharp and everything's really warm, I have this out like as far as it can go, and it, it really, helps quite a bit. And so, you know, if you're one of those people where everything you play, you know, just tends to be sharp, I would recommend getting a longer barrel. And if you can't do that, um, 
well, I'll talk really quick about the tuning of the different joints of the clarinet. And so I apologize if, you know, if Kevin, if you already know this, um, but I need to cover this. So if you pull out or push in right here at the barrel, it will affect the tuning of the entire instrument. And so um, because it's up here, it just makes the instrument a little bit longer. So I would recommend pull out until you get to the cork and almost to the cork, right? So, um, and today I've just been loving my stock barrel, the sound of it, and it's not super hot today, so I haven't been really sharp. So, you know, you can pull out about that much. Now, if you don't like how that sounds, because that can actually change the tone a little bit, you can put tuning rings in there. Um, so, if you do this and it turns out that it makes your throat tones a little too low, but everything else is kind of in tune, then you need to push back in about halfway and then try pulling out a little bit in the middle joint and a little bit here at the bottom joint. And this here will actually affect these notes. So your pinky keys, if you pull out here in the middle, it'll affect all of the notes from this part of the clarinet down. And so I would experiment a little bit with um, lengthening the, the instrument. Now, if you're still just playing super sharp, and, and, you've, and you've tried this, um, then check your mouthpiece. I've found that older mouthpieces, at least for me, they tend to go sharper uh, the longer I have them. And also, um, let's see, let's see. Other, oh yeah, Van Doren makes two different types of uh, mouthpieces for clarinets, right? So there's the traditional pitch, which is tuned a bit higher to 442 and then there's the 13 series which is tuned to 440 and I actually have found that the traditional pitch is like a lot higher and the 13 series is a lot lower so I mean they may say it's only two cents difference between the two but I think it's a lot more so I would recommend getting a 13 series mouthpiece and see if that also lowers the pitch so um, you know, if, if buying a new instrument is out of the question, try getting a longer barrel and a 13 series mouthpiece. And also experiment with lengthening the, the instrument. Now, the last thing um, that you can do personally to just improve your intonation across the registers of the instrument is to actually play long tones with a drone. And one of my favorite things to do is to just put on some headphones and a a cello drone and go to I think a few months ago I posted a legato warm-up and so you should check it out maybe I'll put a link here below but I, I like to just listen to the drone and play with the drone because there are some adjustments you can do with your air you can do very minor adjustments with your adjustments with your embouchure to make the pitch go up and down and then last of all throat tones we know tend to be a little bit sharp which brings me to another question from a patron about throat tones being flat what that's just crazy right like how can throat tones be flat but I, I've discovered a, a couple of things can cause throat tones to be flat one is if you're using a too soft of a reed and you're just overblowing it can actually really make these guys just the pitch go like way low. Another thing I mentioned a little bit earlier is if you pull out too much here, it's going to also make these guys go a lot lower than they're supposed to be. The natural tendency is for these notes to be sharp. So you have to actually add resonance fingerings to lower the pitch and it will add resonance. And so if you're pulling out a whole bunch here and it's affecting the intonation here, just push it, push it back in a little bit. And also, if you're using too soft of a reed and, and they're super flat, try just going up half a size and, and see if that improves the intonation a little bit. Um, so um, I hope that kind of helps your question, Kevin. Um, and you know, if you have more questions, you can just send it to me on Patreon and I'll, I'll do the best I can to help out. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next patron question, um, which all of this is kind of tied together. So this is really great. Um, so Roy asks, I would like you to talk a little bit about mouthpieces. It's hard to know what to choose when you don't live near a real music store. Also during the pandemic, you can't just like get a whole bunch of mouthpieces and try them all, right? Like nobody's doing that. So um, let's see. So. 
couple of couple of things about mouthpieces. Um, for for B flat clarinet, I I really really like. Um, let's see, I think there are three or four different mouthpieces that I really like, and they're all made by Van Doren. So. Um, a lot of my studio plays on either a 5RV lyre, an M13 lyre, or a BD5, um, or an M30, yeah, or an M30. So those tend to just kind of sound the best to me and feel the best to my studio. And so for the 5RV lyre, you're going to want to match that with three or three and a half strength reeds. The M13 lyre, if you play on that, um, or if you want to play on an M13 lyre, you're going to probably want to play on like three and a half or three and a half plus. When I play on an M13 lyre, I put fours on that because the longer facing of the mouthpiece requires harder reads. And so it's just a balancing game, right? So 5RV lyre is like a medium long facing. M13 lyre is on is, is longer i think it's a long facing the bd5 is unique it has a medium long facing and it has a wide wider tip opening and so you want to balance that out with like medium strength reads so i really like playing on like three and a halves or softer three and a half pluses on the bd5 um although there are lots of people out there who play with fives on that so i don't know um i think i think it's it's a tricky game trying to match hard reads to an open mouthpiece because you can um, inadvertently start biting, which is bad, right? So if you want to play on the BD-5, which has a really beautiful sound, try to pair that with slightly softer reads. And then what's the other one? The M30 is also medium facing, medium tip opening. And that one I prefer to also play on like medium hard reads as, or medium strength reads as well, like a, like a three and a half also. Um, so you want to check into the, the sound concept you're going for. So the, let's see, the 5RV Lyre, I think has a very classic sound to it. There's richness to it and it projects really well. And it's like that classic kind of American sort of soundscape. Um, that that a lot of us are going for and it's also a really great mouthpiece too if you happen to be a teacher it's a good mouthpiece to build good fundamentals off of as well it's just very stable with sound and intonation as well so you can play on a 5 RV lyre at any level and sound pretty good um, I think something similar goes for the M13 lyre um, but you're gonna have to play with slightly harder reeds and a bit more air and it's going to have um, in my opinion, a bit more of a sparkle to the sound. Um, you, personally, I really like, I like the M13 Lyre quite a bit. And um, let's see, Bert Hara played on an M13 Lyre for a long time, and I think there are some videos of him, and I just love his sound. So you should check out, check out some videos of him playing on that. But it's a great mouthpiece, and I've had students as young as like 10 years old playing on an M13 lyre and then you know people who are professionals will play on it too and so to me that's also more of a classic sound more clear and focused and just like projected and um, that brings me to let's see the M30 so the M30 you can get that clear focus sound from that um, it's a very comfortable mouthpiece to play but um, to me it also has a little bit more roundness in the sound and um, a little bit more flexibility. So if you're looking for that, I think that tends to be a little better for more intermediate to advanced players. Um, I think younger players have a hard time controlling the sound on that. And lastly, I think um, the BD-5 is probably best for advanced to professional level. Um, it's just really hard to get the right kind of air on that mouthpiece, but the BD-5 has has a nice covered sound and it also has the potential to be very brilliant and colorful and projected which is why it's one of my favorite mouthpieces to play on so let's see um i hope that kind of helps you guys answer a few questions about mouthpieces um and let's see uh, for bass clarinet i've i actually i really settled into um b40 i, I love the b40 mouthpiece 
to be honest, I haven't tried to be BD5 on the bass clarinet, so I can't really tell you uh, much about that mouthpiece. But I've been playing on B40s on my bass, on the bass. I don't have my own bass, unfortunately. Not yet. Um, but I've been playing on a B40 mouthpiece for years, and I just, I love it. It's just so rich and easy to play, and it makes it easy. I'm, I'm not mainly a bass clarinet player, so I switch over, and it just feels so much easier to switch from clarinet to bass clarinet when I'm using the B40. Um, anyway, so I hope that helps. I'm going to move on to another question. Um, I know I'm talking really fast here, but let's see. Where's my other question? I had another, I have another question page. And we talked about reed strength. Somebody asked about that, I think. Yeah, pairing reed strength with reeds. And, you know, um, I think someone had asked about pairing, how do you know when to go up to a harder reed strength? And honestly, it really depends on your mouthpiece and, and how much air you use. And I try to move my, my younger students um, up to at least a three. Um, as soon as possible just uh, because it really helps develop a bit more air support and then by the time they get to like I don't know like early to mid high school they should be playing on three and a half or so and that's across the board for most most of the mouthpieces they play on and you know if they're playing on like an M13 lyre and they're sounding kind of shrill and thin and I'm like what kind of reed are you using and they're playing on three and a half I switch them to three and a half plus or fours um because a lot of times we just get really comfortable playing on the reeds that are that are just like kind of easy to get a sound out of but we don't really uh, get out of our comfort zone to make sure that we're like getting the best sound and so I think um you know if you're a full-grown adult and you've been playing your instrument for more than like a year, you probably have enough air support to, to start playing on at least a three. And then maybe after a couple of years, um, I would move up to a three and a half. Um, so I hope that helps. And again, it depends on the mouthpiece. Longer facing need harder reeds. Shorter facing needs softer reeds. Wider tip opening needs softer reeds. Smaller tip opening needs ugh, harder reads. That was confusing because I also watched myself backwards in the camera. Anyway, I hope you guys follow that. Um, cool. So I hope that helps there. And let's see. Okay. So I actually had um, a patron ask about a very specific passage um, regarding pinky fingerings. Um, so I'm going to go through that really quick. So um, let's see, he asked about, this is from Robbie, he asked about going through the fingerings um, for E flat on the A flat major and minor arpeggios. And let's see, let's see if there's any occasion when you have to slide from F sharp to bottom E. And, and earlier today he actually sent me the excerpt that he's working on for that. So, um, my rules for fingerings is you should try as hard as you can to figure out a way to not slide. And most of the time you can. Um, however, the excerpt that he sent me is an exception to the rule. Um, but there's a very specific way I think about doing those fingerings. So the first thing I'm going to do is show you the fingerings for um, the A flat major arpeggio. So um, if if I'm correct, I think you might be a saxophone player. And if you're a saxophone player, every student I've had, I don't know much about saxophone, but everybody I've had that switches from saxophone to clarinet or doubles likes to play E flat with this guy right here. And so I'm not sure if you're doing that, but I'm gonna say, if you are, try using the side key for the E flat when you're doing the A flat major arpeggio. So you've got the, what? A flat, C, E flat, A flat, I'm singing the wrong notes. And then you wanna do left hand C over here when you go over the break. And then this E flat here, and then of course this A flat here. So 
again, you know, normal A flat, you got C, use the side E flat, and then the normal fingerings there, left hand C, and then just E flat here. Um, and then likewise, um, let's see, uh, well, it would be, it would be the same, just use the side fingering. I don't, I don't like doing any, like, uh, I don't like doing one and one type fingerings too often. Um, so I just do the side fingerings for all of that. So I hope that helps. And then just do, uh, do the B on the right hand here, left hand here as well. And um, hopefully, hopefully that answers your question there. So give this guy a try if you're trying to do this. Um, and so um, the excerpt, let me see, do I have my phone here? Actually, I'll just pull it up. So everybody can see the excerpt. Um, maybe I can flip around my, let's see, maybe I can flip around my computer um, for you guys to see. I hope you don't mind. I think this will just be really interesting for everybody to see. Um, so the trouble here is, let's see, um, you're playing an E flat major. Okay, so you've got four sharps in the key signature, and this is in, there we go, okay, this is in the low register, so I don't know if you guys can see that, but we're right here, and if you look, um, let's see, at the end of measure two, going into measure three, yeah, going into measure three there, oh, man, it's like, kind of impossible to do that without sliding. So um, I actually don't like ever having to slide from F sharp to E flat. Like having to do this just makes my knobby fingers just kind of cringe. Um, so what I would do there is actually in, at the end of measure two, going from G sharp to F sharp, I would just go down like that from G sharp to F sharp. And then, then that frees you up to do, do E with the left hand. Guys, I don't know my left or my right. Um, e with the left hand, and then you've got the G sharp, yeah, um, going in there. And then, and then, oh yeah, and then at the end of the third measure, going into the fourth measure, you got to jump from an E, uh, a G sharp, down to an E and then play the E major scale. So I actually just jump, jumped it, would jump down like that. Now, <laughs> that being said, I've got this wonderful little extra key right there. So I actually would probably just use that instead. But when I didn't have this, um, I, I found it easier to just go down like that. So, and also kind of jump down like that. So I hope that helps. Um, I think that's like the bum 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 bum. Shoot, I've already practiced this so much with this. <laughs> that, I need to, okay. Okay, yeah, that's what I would do. Uh, so I hope that helps. I know I'm talking really fast, but I'm trying to get a lot of information in. So if you still have questions, you know, um, Robbie, just let me know. Send me a message, and I'll uh, and I'll try to clarify that. Um, okay. So what else do we have? Um, let's see. Actually, I think we're doing pretty well. Um, so, okay. Before I take everybody else's questions, a patron just a couple of months ago in a live stream um, that I did just for patrons had asked me how to play. Off. And I was like, what? I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, like there's some things you like don't really think about, um, and then you just do it. And then I asked my friends, I was like, how do you guys play soft? And I don't. They were like, well, I don't know. And like nobody really knows. Who knows how to play soft? Okay. Well, I actually kind of really thought about it, and I think I'm onto something. I don't know. I'm just gonna kind of like throw this out there, but when you play. You have to play with really fast air, and when you start, you have to play with like high velocity air, right? And that's where your air support comes from. 
and the speed of your air should stay the same whether you're playing loud or soft. I think it's just the volume that changes. And so when you're practicing long films from very soft to very loud, or, or when I'm practicing long films from very soft to very loud and back down, I have found that my core is actually so much more engaged in the, in the softer dynamics. And I realized like, if you don't have enough air speed, the reed isn't going to vibrate and then you're not going to have a good sound in, in, in the soft dynamics, right? So you just got to keep that pressure going even as the volume goes down. And that brings me back. I, I went to a master class back in college. Denzel Fuchs came to DePaul. It was so cool. Um, and he like played the softest I'd ever heard in my life up to that point on clarinet. And he was just like, you have to continue going through the eye of the needle. And now I realize like what he was doing, right? So like the fastest stream of air, the smallest volume, but the air has to be so concentrated and so fast. So I hope that kind of helps. Um, I'm sure my ideas will change at some point in the future, but that's kind of where I'm at right now mentally. So I hope you guys can kind of follow that and I hope that helps. And yeah, if you have any ideas, you know, just add them to the comments here. Um, but yeah, that's where I'm at. Okay, let's see. So, did I answer everybody's, let's see, questions? We've got the pinkies and then the reed strength and yeah, um, I, I had one more question from a patron who was playing on uh, s uh, soccer reeds on um, an N13 lyre and, and saying like, you know, when he tries to play on harder reeds, um, it just sounds fuzzy and airy. And, you know, I would just say, just work at it. You just gotta blow harder like you're, you know, blowing up a beach ball. <sighs> the air that you blow should be fast. And, and rather noisy and I promise you if you play with noisy fast air the the sound you produce will be very pure but it's gonna take a lot of work and you kind of have to build up the muscle for it um, so while you're working in the to the harder strength of reed which will work really well with your M13 wire um, just be patient and and kind of let the muscle build over time so um, give you know maybe try a like all of the threes in your box and try easing into it by playing on a couple of the softer ones for a little while and pretty soon you'll be using so much air you'll be like i sound like a kazoo that's when you have to switch to the harder reads in the box right um so give that a try and um you know just use a bit more air and hopefully hopefully that'll that'll help um a bit more air and faster air okay now, time for everybody else's questions. Let's see. Um, I haven't been reading the chat, so I feel like this is going to be really entertaining because I know some of my students are on here too. Um, let's see. Can hear you. You guys can hear me. <gasps> Toronto, Canada. That's so cool. Oh, and Ryan's here. Oh my goodness. And there's Camille and Jay and Dan. Oh my goodness. This is so great. Oh, Nora. Uh, okay, cool. So first question, let's see, Ryan, I think that's the first question here. Oh my goodness. Okay. So Ryan, thanks for coming by. So he's one of my uh, younger students, actually, he's in middle school. Um, I hope you don't mind me sharing that. Um, he has worked really hard the past few weeks and he's sounding so good and he's learned a bunch of scales and I'm really proud of him. Um, anyway, so he asks, how old were you when you knew you wanted to pursue a career in music with clarinet? I was 13. I was in eighth grade. And well, at that time, I didn't know what sounded good. I just knew that I could push a button, bu bunch of buttons really fast. And so I was like, hey, I trained myself to play any fast thing. If this is what being a professional is about, I can do this. Um, but eventually, <laughs> eventually I fell in love with the sound of the clarinet because I started going to like real concerts and I, I heard that the clarinet could actually sound like really beautiful and I was like, ooh, I don't sound like that. I sound like a, I don't know, like I'm honking or something. Anyway, <laughs> so I was, I was in eighth grade. I just, I just really loved uh, playing clarinet. I like, I've never been very good at singing. Um, so I, 
really like that I had the ability to play very expressively um, on something besides my voice. So the clarinet kind of became my voice, and that's kind of kind of how that went. So that's a really good question, Ryan. Thank you. Okay, let's see. All right, next question. Jay, any pieces you recommend for auditions? I was thinking about playing for some professors to get into college. Let's see. Um, yeah, that's great. I mean, I, it depends on kind of what you want to do when you go to college. Um, if you're, you know, if you're, I think most college um, requirements ask for contrasting etudes or maybe a solo piece. And so, um, if you are familiar with the rows 32 etudes or 40 studies, um, you know, you could choose a slow piece and a fast piece from one of those. And those are perfectly fine um, to, you know, audition for college and beyond. I mean, I did my petition to major at DePaul um, with a couple of rose etudes and like, like a million excerpts. But anyway, rose etudes were part of the part of the process there. So I would say that rose etudes, check those out. Um, another thing that you should probably know if you don't already is uh, the Weber Concertino. That's pretty standard. Um, and let's see, I started seeing the Osborne Rhapsody for Clarinet out on college audition list lately. Um, some colleges even ask for Stravinsky three pieces. Um, so, and also most of them ask for memorized major and minor scales. So if you don't already have a sheet of major and minor scales, um, I released the scale video a couple weeks ago and I have a PDF you could download for that. So check that out and you can, you know, memorize based off of that. Um, and I have major scale and all of the minor forms um, on one page and it goes one key per page. So you can kind of take your time through that. So I hope that helps. Um, you want to just pick stuff that showcases your musicality and uh, most of the time, um, you know, something like like Rose or Weber, Stravinsky, Osborne, standard repertoire like that will showcase um, your knowledge of different time periods. Um, so, uh, Nora Schaefer asks, what is Camille's favorite piece of music? Oh god, she was not happy with that. What's your favorite music? Well, I don't know. She said meow, and I guess it's music? Okay, that wasn't funny. Um, yeah, she actually hates the clarinet, so her favorite moment of my practicing is whenever um, I put the clarinet away. <laughs> okay, so, oh no, it's lagging! Wait, for real? Or, I don't know. Okay, anyway, um, let's see, any other questions? Um, let's see, uh, does Camille like the clarinet? Oh, we already, yes, <laughs> she does not. <laughs> Oh, what model? Oh, yeah. So I play on a Yamaha custom CSVR. I play on the ASP model. So it's like the artist model. So it has like the fancy keyword here. And oh man, I love this part right here. It has metal tenon rings right here. So your clarinet doesn't get stuck when the weather changes. And also you get a really good seal and it doesn't crack as easily. So I love it. It does make it a little heavier though, but I just love the sound of the, the CSVR. So um, I would definitely highly recommend it. Even, even just like the entry level model of the CSVR is just a beautiful sounding instrument. Um, let's see, Nathaniel Moore, we bass clarinets have almost no need for the so-called soft. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> You're funny. Okay, let's see. What are you, Callie Grinder, that's weird. Okay, I'm sorry, what's that mean? I'm, oh my god, I'm saying things. What are your tips, it's just, wait, your name is spelled the same as mine. Okay, what are your tips and tricks to get better at the clarinet? All right, so, oh my gosh, so... Let's see, oh, tips and tricks. I would say just practice scales. Practice scales every single day of your life forever. Don't ever stop playing scales. Learn your arpeggios, learn your thirds, learn all of these patterns. Um, they're gonna come up in music like every 
ev- like everything you play, they're going to come up. And I mean, I even start, I start my beginners on scales too. I have a girl who's been playing just a few months and she knows six, wait, seven scales now. And she can play some of them two octaves. And so like, that's kind of cool. Um, anyway, so other tips and tricks. So another really great tip is to just make sure you're always using a lot of air. You just want to just just shoot that air out like you're, again, like I said, like you're blowing up a beach ball or a balloon or you're blowing out a candle, something like that. And keep that high speed going all the way until the end of the phrase. You actually have a lot more air than you think you do. So the only way to really test your limit is to try. So I'd say air and scales. Let's see. Please, please post some notes on your mouthpiece discussion. I will do that. Um, let's see. I'll share that on Patreon at some point. And yes, Camille is sleepy. She's so sleepy. <laughs> um, how long does it take you to master a rose study or an etude? I mean, it depends on the study. I mean, like, it used to take me, um, like months to just learn, like, one of the more difficult etudes. Um, actually, I'm going to pause this really quick. Um, let's see. I think there's something weird happening here. What'd you say, Dan? Go back to problem. Mine said air all of a sudden. Oh, you have to refresh. Okay. So, sorry guys. Um, Hopefully this is still this is still working right now. It looks like people are this is still going. If you guys get the error message, you just have to refresh the browser. I don't know what's going on with that. So um, anyway, let's see. Um, okay, where was I on this? Editions, Camille, Bob. How long does it take? Yeah, so a rose study um, now. I mean, I, I, I kind of know most of them, so it may take me just a couple of days to brush up on it. Um, but, you know, if I'm learning something totally new, it, it also just depends on how unfamiliar I am with the patterns. Um, like, I haven't, let's see. Uh, I don't know. It could take me maybe maybe a week or two weeks to learn an etude that I like really really well that I'm very unfamiliar with like some of the ool uh studies I think are kind of challenging and they have non-standard fingerings and so those are a little tricky so that may take me maybe a week or two so I try to do I don't know I try to stick with like one etude or study per week um Lately, I've been going through the Opperman studies, and I'm in the intermediate book right now, and they're just really fun. So I just play like a bunch of <laughs> that I really like over and over because they're so much fun. Uh, so I highly recommend them. Um, everybody should definitely start with the elementary method because those are anything but elementary. They're very hard, um, but they're also very fun. So. Um, Anyway, I'm getting off topic, but I hope that I hope that answers your question. So, Christopher, let's see. Do you have any strategies for keeping left hand fingers lower in fast passages, like like the Opperman velocity studies? I'm right-handed, and with shame when I saw how much they came up in a mirror. Yeah, um, there's a technique called an- anchor pinky pinky anchoring. And um, you can, the Opperman studies are actually really great for this. Um, you can practice just keeping your pinkies anchored on the pinky keys, right? So, um, you know, whatever pattern you're going to work on, um, if you're not using that key, you just keep it down. Or the um, Jean Jean Body Make Em, that first uh, page is just like. Right, so if you keep your pinkies pretty anchored, pretty close to the keys, that can help. Um, so that brings me to if you're using other fingers, try to keep your pinkies just kind of lightly grazing or just really close to the pinky keys. If you aim your pinkies for the pinky keys, your the rest of your hands aren't like fingers aren't gonna fly around, right? So 
Um, I find the, the pinky anchoring is a really good anchor point. So um, at the end of the day, though, I am embarrassed to admit that I am not the best at keeping my fingers super close to the keys, as you can probably see in a lot of my videos. Um, so uh, when I really need to brush up on that, um, that's what I do. I really focus on, um, I, I like to body make them a lot, just trying to keep everything close. So um, I hope that helps. Um, let's see. <laughs> Belle, Camille's so cute. Yes, she is very cute. She's so snappy. Um, oh, my good kitty. Let's see. What else? Thank you for answering. Uh, Nathaniel Moore, it is lagging. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with the connection. Um, let's see. Oh, Sophie asks, have you played the clarinet on any big stage? Um, I don't know. I played at Symphony Center, so for two years, uh, 2016 to 2018, I was the clarinetist in the Civic Orchestra of Chicago. So um, for those of you who don't know, that's a training orchestra for the Chicago Symphony. And um, yeah, it was a great time. Got to work with members of the CSO and um, learned a lot from them. And we had guest conductors for like for two years and it was, it was so great. So we had like, um, we had like Christoph Eschenbach for one and um, uh, who's the guy? God, I'm so dumb. There we go. Ken David Masur. Oh my God. Yeah. And um, oh, I'm drawing a blank now. But yeah, we had a bunch of really excellent conductors. So that that was pretty cool and very scary because it, it meant what you know we had to like you know know our stuff before the first rehearsal. <laughs> um, and uh, you know that that's what you go to music school for though. You get kind of you get it kind of beaten into you to make sure you like learn your stuff ahead of time so you're not tripping over yourself in the first rehearsal so um anyway so yeah i think that's yeah that's um probably the most exciting stage i've played on in a while um dan i'm not gonna answer that that's my significant other if you all want to answer his butter toast question, you can go ahead and do that. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, Sarah is trialing clarinets right now. Any recommendations for finding the right one? Yes, actually, um, I posted a video on um, how I test clarinets, and um, I'll just kind of talk about it really quick um, here. But um, oh no, here we go. Uh, yeah. So I'll talk about it really quick. So um, the first thing I do is I just play a big, full chromatic scale from the lowest note to the highest note I know. And I check all alternate fingerings for every single note. And I do it all slurred. And I do it with a tuner right in front of me. So, you know, if you just pick up an instrument and it's cold, it might take a couple minutes for it to warm up. So, um, you know, just kind of be patient with that. Um, so, uh, you want to check, you want to check, uh, how it, how it tunes, right? And, you know, it's good to go into this with some knowledge of intonation tendencies of the clarinet. So, like, we all know that throat tones tend to be sharp. Uh, low F tends to be flat. Um, aside from that, most everything else should be somewhat stable on the clarinet. Um, if you don't have any personal issues with, with different registers. And so, you know, you just want to play with a nice big full breath of air. And if there are any notes that stick out, like they're very free blowing, or if they're really muffled, or if they're really, really sharp, like more than 10 cents sharp or more than 10 cents flat, um, that's a red flag. So you want to write that down, make note of that. And, um, but if it passes the general test of intonation and feel, so if you're testing, when you test feel, you're testing that no notes stick out or are muffled, then, um, uh, then you can test the instrument for, you know, how it sounds to you and the playability and you'll want to play a couple pieces of music 
or, or at least a couple little excerpts. And um, oh yeah, you also want to check articulation. Some instruments are just very resistant and others are not. And so like um, my old clarinet was um, a bit more free blowing. This one is a little bit more, a little bit, just a tiny bit more resistant. So um, I tend to like slightly softer reeds in this one than I did my old one. So um, when you test out clarinets, make sure you have a variety of reeds and reed strength, um, just so that you're testing the instrument with, with a comfortable setup for you. So yeah, that's what I recommend. So I think if you go back, eh, anyway, I think it was back in March when I posted my clarinet testing video. Um, and also on my website, I have an article on my website, Equipment Testing Guide. So it's a terrible website right now, working on it, updating it, but there is a page um, that you can just kind of print out and have. Um, let's see. Okay, trialing clarinets. I don't know where to trial clarinets right now. Um, yeah, and um, Roy just asked about the different profiles. So there's traditional profile, and then there's profile 88. And I've been trying, I don't know. I've been trying to figure out which one I like better. And it's it really just depends on like what angle you like to hold it at and how it feels in your mouth. So the profile 88 mouthpieces, the beak is more like, it's longer and more narrow. And then the traditional uh, mouthpieces are a little bit shorter and um, more like this. And so, um, yeah, it just kind of depends on, on your preference. Um, I usually go with the um, traditional beak, but I think my M13 wire, which I lent out to somebody months ago and they haven't paid back, but anyway, so, um, I think that was a profile 88 and I really loved it. So, um, I hope that helps there. Um, okay. So I think we have time for maybe one more question, maybe a couple more questions. It looks like there are a couple more here. Um, here, did I just say that? Okay. Nathaniel Moore, when was the last time you played the bass clarinet? What is that emoji? Boo? Are you... Do you think you're asking it? Okay, when was the last time? Uh, for a gig? Like, two years ago. It was sad. Um, but on my own? Like, maybe a couple months ago. Got it out. I thought I was going to record. I had all these plans. I was like, I'm going to record a clarinet choir piece all by myself. And so I got my E flat out, my bass clarinet out. And then I just never did it. So I'm sorry, guys. You're not going to hear me play those anytime soon. <laughs> um, okay, and then, ooh, um, and then, let's see, we have one more question here, Nick Biz, 36, when you're tonguing, does a part of your tongue hit the back of your teeth as well as your reed? No. Uh, how does that happen? Ooh. I don't have a reed on right now, I'm just trying to figure this out. Yeah, you know, I think if that's happening, you probably need to put more mouthpiece in your mouth. I don't know. I would have to hear you play or see you play to know that. Um, but yeah, you should be aiming. I'll just put a read on here. Yeah, so. Oh yeah, I need to clean my mouthpiece, so don't judge me, guys. Okay, so when you articulate, you want to aim for like right here. And so if you're hitting your teeth, you're either pushing so hard that your tongue is like going over the top and like hitting your teeth or like, I don't know, you don't have enough mouthpiece in your mouth. So to know if you're putting enough mouthpiece in, uh, you got to figure out how much of the reed is actually going to vibrate when you play. So if you look at your mouthpiece sideways, oh, you can't really see this. If you look at it sideways and you find the point where the mouthpiece and the reed meet, so just hold it up to the light. And for this mouthpiece, it's actually almost halfway down the reed. So it's about right here. So this is the point where you want to put your jaw pressure. 
and you want to blow against this much of the reed. So this is where all your sound is coming from. And you want to blow at the reed instead of down the mouthpiece, right? So the angle should be more like 45 degrees. So that'll give you much more projection of sound. And so if it's like that, and you have a mouthpiece in, then your mouthpiece should be covering up your teeth and shouldn't be making any contact with that. So I help, or, or maybe, or maybe you're talking about anchor tonguing. Let's see. I'm not sure. There are some, um, there are some people who do anchor tonguing where they actually put the tip of their tongue down by their bottom teeth and then the tongue with the middle of the tongue. And so that's, um, that's a really, um, tricky, um, uh, technique to actually try to pull off because it's going to make your articulation sound kind of foofy and fluffy. Um, so just, I would recommend if you're one of those people who are anchor tonguing, just stop right now and just like break that habit. It's going to really hold back the quality of articulation, the quality of sound. Like it's, it's easy to keep a high tongue position when you do anchor tonguing, but it's, it's going to prevent you from accomplishing a lot of different types of articulation. So um, make sure you're using the tip of the tongue to the tip of the reed. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. Let's see. And okay, and then Sarah said she's a new subscriber. Yeah, cool. Um, I am glad. I am glad that that'll be helpful. So, um, guys, actually, I'm gonna refresh this because my feed just froze. So I'm gonna make sure I don't have any other questions. All right. Well, that looks great, and it looks like we timed this out perfectly. And it looks like. Oh yeah, and if you guys. If you guys um, didn't, let's see, if you didn't catch it the other night, um, there's a new podcast in town called the, the, called the Candid Clarinetist. And um, and uh, it, I was interviewed on Monday night um, for the podcast. And so they have a, a YouTube channel and they have a Twitch channel and then... I don't know, the podcast page or, and everything, so you can, like, download it and listen to it, but um, it's all about starting your own YouTube channel and just, like, different questions about, like, what I go through um, on a regular basis to put up um, a YouTube video, and so it was kind of, you know, my uh, channel was actually just recently monetized, yay! That means um, I... I hit the 4,000 hour view time um, in the past 12 months, and so um, it, it was like perfect timing for for the interview and the um, and reaching monetization. So that's kind of cool. Um, let's see any other questions. Yeah, that's it. So I would recommend checking out the um, uh, yeah, not much money though, Nathaniel. Um, so I would recommend checking out. Um, checking out that podcast. Um, he's actually interviewed like 11 other people, I think. There are 11 other podcast episodes out there. And so I definitely have a little bit of catching up to do, but he's a really great interviewer, asks really great, great questions. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's about it for everything. So um, patrons, if you guys have more questions, just go on to Patreon and let me know. If any of you guys are um, thinking about supporting my channel, um, Patreon is a great place to do that. The, the lowest tier is $3 and it's um, for YouTube followers. Um, I'm actually going to redo a couple of my middle tiers and that's all I'm going to say about that. But I'm, I'm going to be um, very soon uh, launching something um, a little more exciting. Um, but in the meantime, I would say, you know, that's a, the $3 tier is a good way to just say thanks. Um, and also I give private lessons and a bunch of my private students are actually right here, right now, watching this live stream, asking questions, um, leaving fun comments and, and everything. And, um, so, you know, as they can tell you, I love what I do. I love teaching. I love seeing everybody succeed and get really good at their instruments and just enjoy music. Um, so if you're looking for a private teacher, I teach private lessons um, and I do them online and they've been working out great so far. My studio has been taken off. Um, you guys are awesome. So yeah, and 
last but not least, thank you everybody for watching my videos. Um, thank you all for the past few months. Um, I never thought my channel would get to the point where it could be monetized. Um, so this is um, a really big deal for me and for my channel. So thank you guys so much. And yeah, um, until the next live stream, I hope you guys have some great practice sessions. And as always, happy practicing. Okay, now I have to actually stop this. Can't make it like that.